Welcome back to Horrifying Stories. In the unforgiving wilderness, encounters with bears can swiftly shift from awe-inspiring to terrifying. This part 2 compilation of bear attack stories delves into the harrowing experiences of those who faced these formidable predators. Some survived through sheer resilience and quick thinking, while others tragically did not. Each story captures the raw power of nature and the fine line between life and death. Brace yourself for a journey into the wild, where survival hangs by a thread and every moment counts. These are, their horrifying stories. Viewer discretion is advised. Around 2011, it was just another day for Tatiana Tsigenenkov. Her 19-year-old daughter, Olga Moskalyova, and her husband, Olga's stepfather, Igor Tsigenenkov, were out camping near a river not too far from a small village named Termony in Russia. All of a sudden, her phone rang, and it was Olga. The words, Mom, the bear is eating me, and the frantic screams of her dear daughter were what greeted her on the other end of the line. At first, Tatiana thought it was just another one of Olga's prank calls. After all, Olga had always joked around with her. She was a fun-loving, jolly and friendly teenager who had just got her driving license and graduated with flying colors at a music school. However, a few seconds into the call, everything changed when Tatiana sensed extreme terror and suffering in Olga's voice. It was just different. Then, she started to hear the bear growling and chewing on her. To even say that it was chilling or horrifying is an understatement. Here she was, helpless and frustrated on the phone, listening to her daughter being eaten away by a bear. Mom, it's such agony. Mom, help. Her desperate daughter cried out. Tatiana dropped the call, and immediately contacted her husband, Igor, who was with her daughter on that trip. She was supposing she could alert her husband, to go find where Olga was, so he could save her. Apparently, the phone just kept ringing. After many desperate attempts to reach her husband, depressingly, no one is picking up his phone. Extremely frustrated and still in shock, Tatiana found herself answering another call from Olga. It had been 30 minutes since her first call, and Olga was obviously already very weak and in great agony. In spite of this, she mustered the strength to tell her mom that the bears were back. In her own chilling words, Mom, she came back and brought her three babies. They're eating me. After the call was dropped once again, overcome by panic and fear for her daughter's life, Tatiana did everything she could to send help to Olga. She reported the incident to authorities in the nearby Termony village, telling them her daughter was camping by the river, and she badly needed help. She tried to contact family members whom she knew were near the site as well, since her husband was still unreachable. Then, her phone rang and for the third time, it was Olga. Around an hour after her first call, it was then that Tatiana heard her daughter's final goodbye. Mom, it's not hurting anymore. I don't feel the pain, forgive me for everything, I love you so much. The call was dropped for the last time. Igor's brother and the authorities arrived at the campsite 30 minutes too late, and it was then that they knew why Igor could not answer his wife's desperate calls. They caught a huge brown bear eating up Igor's remains. It was the mother bear that also attacked Olga. A few meters from where the brown bear and Igor were, they found and retrieved the mauled body of Olga. It was later found out that it was Olga's stepfather that was first attacked by the hungry brown bear and her three cubs. The two apparently, just returned to the river to look for the fishing rod that Igor left earlier that day. While Igor was searching for the rod in the tall grasslands along the river, the mother bear launched and pounced on him. It thrashed out on him, broke his neck and crushed his skull into pieces. Olga, who was just around the corner, saw everything unfold before her eyes. At the sight of the terrifying attack on her dad, she knew she didn't stand a chance with the bear. So, she gathered all her strength and ran as far as she could away from the bear and her dad. 
She managed to run for around 70 yards, but suddenly, the bear caught sight and charged right at her. In no time, the mother bear was right behind her, grabbed her leg, pinned her to the ground and began to devour her. Now, brown bears usually charge on all fours when launching an attack. Their ears are usually pinned to the back and use their sharp teeth to bite their prey or their pointed claws, to rip their victim's flesh. Brown bears usually target the neck or head, leaving the prey usually unable to put up a fight. In Olga's case, her ruthless predators devoured her slowly but steadily, as if playing with her, allowing her to call her mother in the most painstaking call a mother and daughter could ever have. A total of three calls in a span of one hour was made, giving a real-time account of the grueling and horrifying ordeal with a brown bear family. As her mom would put it, Olga was a dreamer. She had always dreamt of becoming a psychologist. She was determined and focused on her goals, and has always been a brilliant young lady. She had a bright future waiting for her, as opportunities were just starting to open up for her. Tragically, her life had to end so soon. Because the attack took two lives, wanting to make sure they won't claim any more lives, authorities sent out six hunters to search and kill the mother bear and her three cubs. Colin Dowler, a local in Quadra Island of British Columbia, Canada, went out on a Saturday, July 29, 2019, for a quick adventure before he turns 45 the following Monday. He was headed for 7,000 feet high Mount Dougie Dowler, which coincidentally was named after his grandfather who owned the longtime general store in the island. His main goal wasn't to climb all the way to its summit but just wanting to try finding an alternate route going up the mountain. He was supposed to go with his usual adventure buddy, but after having been declined, he decided to still push through solo. After all, no one else would probably be interested and patient enough to take time in finding an alternate route. Despite being fully aware that he was in bear country, he wasn't worried about going out there alone. He brought bear spray with him along with a pocket knife that his dad had just given him a few weeks prior. What he was more worried about in going alone was the dangers of falling and getting lost. Mount Dougie Dowler was pretty much uninhabited. The nearest shelter was a logging camp located about 10 miles down a valley. With his mountain bike in tow, Colin boarded a boat to the camp which was around 15 miles away from Quadra Island. Upon reaching the logging camp, no one was around except for the camp cook. The cook was kind enough to offer him a ride going up the logging road. At the drop-off point, Colin left his bike and started making his way up the mountain. Not long after, he came across a bear sign and some elderberry bushes that seemed to have been ripped off. Upon seeing this, he continued on with his hike but talked to himself out loud and made all sorts of noises. He had already done this before and it had been quite effective so far. He made it to the Alpine without any signs of bear nearby. Colin decided to camp at the Alpine for the night. The next morning, he explored the area. After having checked all that he had planned to, Colin started to make his descent. He reached the drop-off point where he had left his mountain bike and started biking his way back to the logging camp. About 2 kilometers into his 9-kilometer ride, as he came upon a road bent just near the 7-kilometer marker, he saw a 9-foot-long male grizzly bear blocking his way about 100 feet away from him, and started walking towards him. Immediately, Colin pressed on the brakes and stopped at once. He grabbed for his outer pocket where he had initially put his bear spray. To his surprise, it was no longer there. It must have fallen out of his pocket somewhere along the way. So many thoughts ran through his head, he considered trying to escape by biking as fast as possible away from the bear but he knew the bear could easily outrun him. Without any bear spray at hand, the only option left was for him to stay put and stand his ground, hoping the bear will just trail off and leave him. He put down his backpack and got one of his hiking poles. He extended the pole and held it in front of him. He tried talking to the bear but as it drew closer and closer, around 20 feet away from him, he froze and stopped talking. The bear continued to move forward until it reached his bike's front tire. The bear moved his head downward, as if in a nodding action. At that point, both of their eyes met. 
Nervous and afraid to look at the bear in the eye, Colin looked away first. Suddenly, to his disbelief, the bear continued walking and it has now walked past him. Deep inside, he hoped this was it, his closest encounter with a bear. He somehow thought it would be great if he had caught that moment on camera, a grizzly walking past him calmly. However, just as its back went past the rear tire of his bike, the grizzly suddenly turned around and walked back closer to his direction. He still hadn't moved at that point, so it was only his mountain bike that was between both of them. As the bear moved towards him, he slowly started stepping back and tried to talk the bear out of it. It was then that he realized the bear was really going to attack him. He tried to scare the bear away using his hiking pole but the bear was unbothered. Next, he grabbed his backpack and threw it against the bear. He thought the smell of food inside the bag would shift the bear's attention to the backpack. Unfortunately, the bear remained unfazed. The bear swung its huge paws. With nothing else to grab but his bike, he threw his bike onto the bear. For a second, the bear got distracted as it looked at the bike but then, the bear stepped on the bike and charged right at Colin. The bear clenched its sharp teeth onto Colin's left abdomen and dragged him along the trail. Colin was in excruciating pain but he also knew that if he let the bear go on, the next place he'd find himself was in the thick bushes which would all the more lessen his chances of ever escaping or getting rescued. So, Colin put up a fight. He tried to poke the bear's eyes out, but as his fingers went into its big brown eyes, the bear shook him and he went flying off to the ground. He found himself on the road, his legs were in the ditch. But the bear wasn't done with him yet, it started biting his left thigh, frequently stopping in between bites as if savoring the meal. At that moment, Colin's life and the thought of his family flashed before his eyes. His flesh had been ripped open, in the abdomen, in his legs and hands. He felt the bear's sharp teeth to his bone, with its every bite. All of a sudden, he remembered the pocket knife he brought. He slowly moved his hands to grab his two and three fourths inch knife, leaned up and positioned the knife around four inches away from the bear's neck. After making sure he wouldn't go wrong with his angle, he slashed the bear's neck and immediately the bear stopped eating him and stepped slightly back. Before he could reach out and go for another stab, the bear's blood came rushing down from its wound and landed right where it was chewing on. Now, Colin was now drenched in both his own blood and that of the bear's. The bear moved slowly away and Colin saw it poop twice and peed, a clear indication that it was in deep pain and stress. The bear then moved forward, around 50 feet past Colin and turned around and looked at Colin and then into the bush. Colin still tried his best to restrict his movements, afraid that the bear might charge at him again. On the other hand, he also knew that if he didn't act fast he'd lose all of his blood and not make it out alive. Again, using his knife that definitely came in very handy, he cut off a portion of his long sleeve shirt and wrapped it around his leg in a tourniquet. It was then that he saw how ripped apart his flesh was. After the bear was nowhere near and out of sight, Colin sat up and started using his right leg to push his whole body on the ground to get to his bike. At first attempt, he fell off the bike and back to the ground. It was excruciatingly painful but he knew this was his last chance. The logging camp was still four miles away from where he was and there was no mobile signal in the area to call for rescue. On his second attempt, he was able to successfully get back on his bike. With much struggle using only his right leg, he pedaled his way back to the logging camp. He grabbed every chance he could get to glide his way through until he finally arrived at the logging camp. Thankfully, an entire logging crew of five men was at the camp that day. Colin, along with his bike, dropped on the stairs leading to the camp's mess hall. With all the strength that's left of him, he yelled as loud as he could for help and in no time, the five men came rushing to his side. They carried Colin into the building and wrapped his left leg and removed the tourniquet off. Everyone then alternated on putting pressure on his wounds, especially his abdomen. Roughly two hours since the attack, Colin was airlifted to a hospital in Vancouver. While inside the medevac, IVs were attached to Colin and because Colin had already lost a lot of blood, medics had to perform blood transfusion while in transit. The good thing was that the medevac had just recently been permitted to bring blood on board. Had this not been the case, 
Colin's chances of making it to the hospital alive could have been very slim. All in all, they used up two units of blood for the transfusion. Upon their arrival at the hospital, Colin was immediately subjected to surgery around midnight. The procedure took six hours and he spent more than a month in the hospital due to severe infection and nerve damage. As for the bear, conservation officers hunted down the bear the following day. It didn't take long for them to find the exact area of the attack. Bloodstains on the ground clearly showed the traces despite having had a heavy downpour the previous night. They were even able to track down which side of the bushes the bear went and the blood trail led them into the woods. However, the blood trail slowly faded until it was completely gone. They were about to return to the main logging road, when one of them smelled the bear. When he turned around, they saw the bear 12 feet behind them. The officer was quick to fire shots at the bear and eventually killed it. Apparently, the bear seemed to have kept an eye on them the whole time. This brought them to a conclusion that it was after all, a predatory attack. By September 2020, Colin was already able to run a half marathon. He admits that there are really times when he looks back and thinks if there ever was something that he would have done differently, that could somehow put him in a better situation, but he chooses to leave those behind and move forward with his life. He just wished he didn't lose the pepper spray that day. It was in August 2005, in Canada's Northwest Territories. All the way from Minnesota, Alex was with his five other friends on a six-week whitewater canoe trip. Their 600-mile wild adventure started from Lake Holdia and had already spent four weeks canoeing their way through the wilderness of the Northwest Territories. Headed for Baker Lake in the Arctic Territory of Nunavut, the group of six set up camp at Princess Mary Lake. Alex decided to go on a quick climb to a ridge above their camp to bask in the captivating views of the vast Canadian wilderness and the lakes that cut through it. Not long after he reached the top, he noticed movement from across him. With a slight hint of brown fur, Alex initially thought it was a musk ox. However, in a matter of seconds, he quickly realized it wasn't when a 600-pound grizzly appeared 30 feet across him. As the bear emerged and caught sight of him, it seemed to have been caught off guard as much as Alex. With his heart pounding fast and body in fight or flight mode, he began to step back quietly and with a soft voice tried to calm the bear down somehow attempting to let it know he was no threat. On all fours, the grizzly slowly approached him seemingly trying to figure out what he had stumbled upon. Then, all of a sudden, the bear charged at him growling. Alex screamed for help but his friends were 200 yards away from him down at the campsite. There was no chance they could hear him from above. With nothing but a 15-pound camera case on his hand, Alex threw it forcefully in the direction of the bear. The group had brought bear sprays with them for the trip but it was just back at camp, Alex didn't think of bringing one with him to the ridge as the thought of coming across a bear never really crossed his mind. Thankfully, the camera case landed right on target. It hit the grizzly snout and knocked its head to the side, giving him time to run out of the bear's way. The grizzly got sidetracked for a bit but not long after, it charged at him again. With surprising speed, the bear easily caught up with Alex. The two ran around in circles as if in a bullfight. Alex did his best to escape the bear's huge paws. As their circle grew smaller, the grizzly swung its sharp claws at Alex. He dodged right in time as he barely missed the bear's claws, it only brushed his shoulder. Another swipe brushed through his back. However, when he tried to steer clear of the bear's jaws, the bear went for another slap with his huge paws and hit Alex right in his face, immediately sending Alex into the air. He landed hard on the ground hitting his tailbone, and found himself pinned to the ground. The huge bear was now on top of him with its jaws clenched into his leg. As its sharp teeth sunk into both sides of his leg, he felt excruciating pain then lost consciousness. The next thing he knew, having regained consciousness, Alex saw the bear slowly walking away. He continued playing dead as he carefully made sure the bear was completely out of sight. Then as soon as he was sure the coast was clear, a sudden surge of adrenaline pushed him to get up and run around 150 yards towards the cliff overlooking the camp. With excruciating pain in his right leg drenched in blood, 
he screamed for help. At the camp, his friends heard his loud scream and immediately looked up. Initially, they thought he was joking but when Alex managed to limp his way down back to camp, they couldn't believe what they saw. Without hesitation, 27-year-old Dan, the group's guide, came rushing to Alex. Now, his emergency response skills were suddenly put to test. Dan checked on Alex and saw deep punctures in his right thigh and in four other areas. The sharp claws of the bear left marked his back, ankle, and earlobe. The tips of two of his toes also got peeled off. Needless to say, Alex needed immediate medical help but they were 100 miles away from the nearest settlement. The group decided to call the base camp using a satellite phone. They agreed it was best to push through with their original destination to Baker Lake. At this point, Alex could no longer walk any further but his arms were still strong enough to slowly paddle his canoe so they rowed their way to Baker Lake. As they made their way to Baker Lake, they would go on brief stops so Dan could clean his wounds and prevent any threat of infection. They also carefully calculated when Alex would need to take the pain relievers, trying to manage the limited stock they had in their first aid kit. Paddling was already a struggle in itself for Alex, and passing through white waters only made it harder. It was a slow and steady but agonizing journey but the group never lost focus. Alex needed to have an anti-rabies injection within 12 days from the attack. However, five days into their journey, they were already at 30 Mile Lake when they saw early signs of infection in his wounds. Dan was left with no other choice but to perform an improvised surgery, trying to slice out the dying tissue to slow down the spread of the infection. Since it was not very far from Baker Lake, the standby medevac helicopter flew to 30 Mile Lake and immediately Alex was airlifted to Baker Lake. Alex was put on intravenous antibiotics for 12 hours at Baker Lake before he was airlifted again to Winnipeg where Alex got his first anti-rabies shot. He got five shots in total. Right after the whole group had been transported back to safety, Canadian game wardens were deployed to hunt the bear down. However, it was never found. After Alex was discharged from the hospital, he had to take oral antibiotics for six weeks and had to undergo wound care management. The wounds on his right thigh healed after two months, but it took about a year for Alex to fully recover. Having experienced firsthand what it feels to be the one needing rescue, Alex volunteered for a wilderness search and rescue team. He also authored a book entitled, The 29th Day, recounting the day that changed his life forever. His scars didn't really manifest that much in his body. Sometimes when people look at him, they think his harrowing ordeal with the grizzly was all made up. But to Alex, the trauma that he has gone through was real. For many weeks, he has had to deal with nightmares and would wake up in the middle of the night thinking a bear was beside him. Now, 18 years since that horrifying day, the trauma still lingers. Though not as worse as it was before, Alex has become hypersensitive quickly going in fight or flight mode at even the slightest triggers such as twig snaps. In the past few years, Alex has since been back to going on adventures in the grizzly country, having been to Montana's Glacier National Park with friends but now, never without a bear spray in hand. Thank you for making it this far. If you like this video, please click the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Feel free to drop your comments or story suggestions down below, we would love to hear from you. Again, thank you and see you on the next one.